Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras. And coming up in today's newscast, Sudan pushes forwards in the face of growing opposition to normalization with Israel. The Israeli coronavirus cabinet announces the next step in lockdown easements. And Israel marks annual Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Economically crippled Sudan is already now seeing the pending benefits of normalization with Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announcing on Sunday that Israel will immediately be sending $5 million worth of wheat, quote, to our new friends. And that's just the start. But still, can the agreement's opposition be overcome? Hannah Rifkin reports. Israeli and Sudanese officials already scheduling their meetings to advance deals in agriculture, trade, aviation, and migration just three days since announcing newly established ties. And ahead of even fully inking the agreements, Israel sending millions of dollars worth of wheat to Sudan, which has long been struggling financially. In fact, a year and a half has passed since autocratic leader Omar al-Bashir was ousted, but his decades of mismanagement coupled with U.S. sanctions for sponsoring terror groups has left a deep mark. The transitional government in place still trying to get ahead of massive debts and skyrocketing inflation rates. Still, old habits and alliances die hard, and economic fixes or promises may not be enough to sway the opponents to the deal. After all, peace is about as far as you can get from Khartoum's famous three no's policy of 1967, in which Sudan pledged no to peace with Israel, recognition of Israel, and negotiation with Israel. Also, scars still remain from Israeli operations and involvement in Sudan's division with the Christian southern Sudan. Until now, Israel and Sudan were even still technically in a state of war. That said, hopes are still high. The Sudanese foreign ministry announcing discussions to, quote, achieve the mutual interests of two peoples on Sunday while agreeing to officially designate Lebanon's Hezbollah movement as a terrorist organization. In related news, the ink is barely dry on agreements between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and now Sudan. But Middle Eastern relations are in flux again, this time between Israel and Qatar. Israeli officials now saying that ties with the Arab Gulf nation are warming in spite of its continued alliance with Iran. Joining me to discuss is expert on strategic and political developments in the Arab world from the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, Dr. Joshua Krasna. Dr. Krasna, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. So, you know, how would you, just to begin, how would you categorize the ties between Israel and Qatar as they exist today? So, um, the tie between Israel and Qatar has existed uh, uh, for quite a long time, uh, for over 20 years. And um, during uh, uh, the stage of the Oslo Accords in 19, uh, during the years between 1994 and 2000, when Israel's relations with many Arab states, including in the Gulf, improved markedly, it had excellent relations uh, with Qatar. Since then, um, the, Qatar, the relationships with uh, Qatar um, has stayed um, present. It was uh, downgraded uh, after, in 2000, in the 2000s, uh, after the Second Intifada, like with almost all the Arab countries who didn't have formal diplomatic relations. But we've had a relationship uh, with them over time. And in fact, uh, Qatar has been uh, helping us um, both as an intermediary and as a financier uh, with uh, the Hamas uh, government in Gaza. Um, on the other hand, um, Qatar is um, a regional rival of some of our close friends, um, of the UAE, of Bahrain, of Saudi Arabia as well, of the Egyptian government, and is uh, quite close to Turkey, and to an extent, a certain extent close to Iran, certainly closer to Iran than many of the other states in the Gulf. Well, so, you know, do you see Qatar joining the UAE or Bahrain or Sudan? Do you see them maybe crossing the line and... and leaving the axis with Iran and Turkey and, and coming over to the other side? So, um, no, is the short answer. <laughs> um, and I would say uh, there are two, uh, first of all, two different axes. Uh, Qatar has very strong access with Turkey. It's become even stronger 
since the uh, Gulf states and Egypt uh, imposed a uh, blockade on it in 2017. Uh, Qatar's relationship with Iran is uh, more instrumental. Uh, they're quite close to Iran. They share a huge gas field. Uh, they are one of the largest gas exporters in the world, and the field uh, from which they produce their gas is shared with Iran. So they're also quite physically close to Iran, and therefore it's very important for them to have reasonable relationship with Iran uh, at all times. So their relationship with Turkey is, is kind of a love relationship. Their relationship with their Iran is more like, like a good neighbor's relationship. Right, and well, I don't think they're planning... Yes, sorry. No, please. You don't think... And I don't think what? they're planning to... I don't think they're planning to give up either of those relationships mm -hmm. at this stage. All right, well, you know, what would it take to make peace? Because I know that Qatari officials have, have stated often that, you know, the same party line as many of the other Arab states, that, that they will not normalize with Israel until the conflict with the Palestinian Authority is solved. Um, but clearly, as we've seen over the last few months, that that's not as hard of a line as we thought it was. So, you know, what would it take to get there? So that's an excellent question. Well, first of all, um, um, Qatar... Uh, and the UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia are on very different sides um, right now in a split which splits the uh, Sunni Arab states, a uh, split that splits uh, the Middle East in general, where I say is you have Qatar and Turkey on the one hand and most of the other um, Arab states on the other. And in that way, I don't think that Qatar is rushing to follow the UAE or Bahrain or even Saudi Arabia's lead. And um, certainly uh, those three countries that are now um, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, um, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, which already set up relationship, and Sudan, which has basically said it will set up relationship in the, fu in the future, um, they are certainly on the opposite side um, of this uh, divide in the Sunni Arab world. So I'm not sure that the, um, the precedent that the UAE and Bahrain are setting right now uh, is a precedent that the Qataris are interested in following, except, of course, when it comes to the F-35 relationship with the United States. Well, so that's actually my next question, because here, as, as you mentioned, uh, Israeli Energy Minister Yuval Steinitz is now alleging that, you know, the United States may soon sell advanced F-35 fighter jets to Qatar, despite Israel's objections. Uh, and this is after similar reports really that the United Arab Emirates uh, are asking for F-35s as part of their agreement to normalize with Israel, yet Israel has been assured that it will retain its qualitative military edge. So what does that mean? Is Israel looking to receive even more advanced weapons in the near future? So I, I don't know what Israel um, is planning right now. I know that Qatar has um, uh, a very complex and, almost, and very unique uh, situation in the region, which is on the one hand, it is uh, kind of almost at this point a sworn enemy of Saudi Arabia and the UAE who are close allies to the United States. Um, however, um, the Qatar has the largest United States military base in the Middle East at Al-Udaid Air Base. And there are about 10 to 13,000 American troops in Qatar at any given time. And uh, it has been a very important base to prosecute the wars the Americans have been prosecuting in Afghanistan, in the past in Iraq, um, in Syria. So on the one hand, politically, uh, Qatar, uh, politically and strategically, Qatar is, is at odds with uh, other U.S. allies in the region. But on the other hand, it is a very key part of the American strategic um, uh, um, architecture and, and military architecture in the region. In fact, the al Udaid Air Base, which they say is the largest base in the Middle East, Amer largest American ba uh, base in the Middle East, was recently updated at Qatar's expense. Qatar paid $1.8 billion to fix this American air base and make it better. So there is a, a, a complaint. It's a close military ally of the United States, and it's a real key center of, uh, so, of American military power in the Middle East. Well, so, so you know, what, what are the incentives? Who, what, what does the United States have to gain by selling F-35s to Qatar, and what does Qatar have to gain? Why are they asking for it? And what does that do to the balance of power in the Middle East? So um, to jump to the end, I think it doesn't do a lot to the balance of power as it concerns Israel. However, I think the United States is interested in selling the F-35 because Qatar is an important ally. In September, uh, the United States uh, began to discuss making uh, Saudi, making um, Qatar a major non-NATO ally, which is uh, Israel is a major ally, Egypt, Jordan, Kuwait, Bahrain, uh, Morocco. But um, in that uh, a major non-NATO non -NATO ally is almost the highest status you can be, again, without being a NATO ally. It's the same status as Japan. 
right? Um, so um, so the, uh, the United States is thinking about uh, actually upgrading strategic relationship with Qatar, as I said, because of Qatar's military importance, but also because they want to sell weapons to Qatar. Qatar, like UAE and like Saudi Arabia, is one of the big, biggest uh, weapons clients in the world right now. Um, what does it mean for a strategic balance? The Qataris want it because the UAE is going to get it. And Qatar and UAE are two small but very influential countries of about the same size, which have been competing with each other for the past decade. So if the UAE got it from the United States, then the Qataris are going to want to get it from the United States as well. There are also countries that are very similar in certain ways and very different in certain ways. They see each other as arch rivals. So that's why they want it. What, what it means for Israel? Um, I don't see Qatari F-35s as being a particular threat to Israel. Um, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. All right, Dr. Yes. Krasna, thank you so much for taking the time and, and discussing this with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. In other news, anxieties are swiftly rising in Jerusalem as secretary in the prime minister's office tests positive for coronavirus during a routine test screening. Nittany Manson with the details. Authorities already working on contact tracing, with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his team saying they'll do whatever the health ministry advises, following the coronavirus diagnosis of an office secretary. And this as the health ministry finally reports new infection data from the weekend, with the contagion rate standing now at an average of 3%. So with that in mind, the coronavirus cabinet on Sunday has voted on a number of new lockdown easements set to take effect November 1st, next week. The approved framework including the return to school of grades 3 and 4 in capsules and the returning of grades 1 and 2 in half classes on alternate days. Then plans to flesh out details surrounding after-school daycare, transportation and more set to be discussed in the coming days. Meanwhile, the cabinet has also now approved the Israel Tourism Ministry's initiative to label Eilat and the Dead Sea area as green tourism islands, in which guests are encouraged to come and stay on condition of an updated negative corona test. Reactions to all the new easements are mixed, though, many still apprehensive over the risk of releasing lockdown measures too soon again, especially as the infection rate in certain municipalities remains as high as 9% with the government declaring Majd al-Shams, for one, a restricted red zone for at least the next five days. Whatever the case, the total active infections in Israel now number just over 14,000, 510 in serious condition, and the death toll rising to 2,404. So are we exiting lockdowns too fast again, or does the government have a better handle on the pandemic than it did before? Joining us to discuss is Deputy Director General from the Sheba Medical Center, Professor Arnon Afek. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you as well for interviewing me. All right. Now, Professor, they say that the definition of insanity is hoping for different results from the same actions. So which is it? Are we opening too fast or as fast as we safely can? Well, the Ministry of Health uh, set down a plan before the Corona uh, Cabinet of a multi-step opening of the lockdown, nine step, regarding three different measures from the R, the number of infected people, and the percentage of positive results. Well, till now, we just implemented the first step. So to see whether it's too fast or not too fast, we have to wait for the next decisions of the Corona cabinet. All right, well, the Corona cabinet is currently debating whether or not to open first and second grades next week in capsules. What do you think about that? that? That's what we suggested, to open the first and second grade by capsule. If they are not able to open it by capsule, then let them decide which way to open, but not in a way that all the class convenes together. That's, a, for us, a too dangerous risk. Uh, just it's so initial steps of uh, coming out of the lockdown. All right, so uh, what do you think about Netanyahu's six to eight step COVID exit strategy? Well, it's a very careful plan. It's been done very, very carefully. And uh, I do hope that the co cabinet, cor the Corona cabinet will accept it as is and not change it. But that's that what we thought will be a very, very gradual uh, step out of the lockdown. All right. Now, we earlier mentioned the government plan to declare a lot and the Dead Sea area as green tourist islands, so to speak, in which visitors can come as long as they have a current negative COVID test. Is this a good plan in your eye? Well, in public health, there are no 100% measures and no 100% security. But 
in order to keep the, the most of the, I would say the most uh, important or um, the largest safety margins, what they decided is quite logical thing that you do the same thing before flying to Greece. So why to discriminate Israel's isolated uh, touristic areas like a lot or uh, the Dead Sea um, hotels from Greece. And I think it's quite a logical steps taken by the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Tourism in order to have, have these hotels open and, and find another place for Israelis to take their vacations. All right, well, is there anything else that maybe you'd like to add? And let's hope that uh, we'll find very soon a uh, new vaccine. As you know, the Israelis vaccine by the uh, IDF and the Ministry of uh, the Ministry of Defense. They are starting their testings in Sheba Medical Center next week. And I do hope that as soon, but as safety as possible, we have a new Israeli vaccine. Is there an expected date for, for when that will come out? Well, they speak about the middle of 2021, if everything goes right. But uh, at least they follow all the rules and all the take all the safety measures necessary. So what they will administer at the end will be beneficial and will not induce harm to the people of Israel. And that's, I think, the most important part of that of all. And we at Chiba Medical Center are more than happy to join them and to assist in uh, this scientific testing under the IRB committees of Shiba and uh, with the full collaboration of our research institute. All right, thank you so much, doctor. Thank you as well. Now, as Israelis continue to fight against the coronavirus pandemic, so too does PLO chief negotiator Saeb Erekat, whose condition has continued to deteriorate according to hospital officials. Erekat was admitted to the Hadassah and Kerem Medical Center in Jerusalem last week, suffering from severe complications with COVID-19 on top of his weakened immune system resulting from a lung transplant in 2017. Since then, he's been connected to an ECMO machine to support his respiratory functions while receiving concentrated plasma with anti-COVID antibodies. Still, reports say that his condition is taking another turn for the worse, with a fungal infection now being identified on top of his already complicated diagnosis. And hospital administrators are stating that in addition to these medical issues, there's also been some deterioration in other organ systems, as is commonly seen in critically ill COVID-19 patients. But Erekat's family is still holding out for hope. My father tested positive for corona three weeks ago. Uh, he has been hospitalized uh, since one week. Since then, he's been uh, intubated, connected to the ECMO machine. Uh, three days ago, he underwent bronchoscopy, which thankfully uh, revealed that there is no bacterial uh, infection, no viral infection. Uh, but he has one kind of fungus infection and uh, that's most probably due to his uh, low immune status after his lung transplant three uh, years ago because of the drugs he's taking to suppress his immunity. Uh, my father is a fighter. He's fighting this fungal infection and hopefully he will make it. Uh, all the Palestinian people are praying for my father. We thank you all, the family of Saeb Erekat. We thank you all, our Palestinian people and everybody all over the world asking about my father, praying for him. Uh, he'll keep fighting with your prayers. I would like to thank all the doctors, Professor Stephen Nathans, Professor Kramer, Professor Vernon, and all the Arab doctors around us following up my dad's st status and praying for him. Hopefully things will take a better way. Uh, thanks for everyone. Thank you. In the meantime, Israeli development of a coronavirus vaccine is progressing on schedule. The Israel Institute for Biological Research, or IIBR, is confirming that phase one human trials for the vaccine will begin Sunday, November 1, and they will continue through to the spring until receiving approval for, for use on the general public. The head of the IIBR, Shmuel Shapira, saying in a statement that the final goal is to produce 15 million doses of the final so-called Brie Life inoculation for residents of Israel and our close neighbors by this summer. Still, the IIBR, an organization under the umbrella of the Defense Ministry, is far from a final product, with Phase 1 trials set to begin with just two participants, growing to 80 over the month of November, and then again to 960 participants over December. 
And finally, at the same time, should another vaccine beat IIBR to the punch, Israel is also in talks to acquire those drugs. Several dozen vaccine candidates around the world are already also in clinical trials, 10 of which are in advanced phase three human trials involving tens of thousands of participants. Now, until Israel's vaccine is completed, thousands more may become infected. And in the ultra-Orthodox or Haredi Jewish sector, the outbreak has consistently been at its worst. So how are synagogues evolving with the pandemic? According to a new Hebrew media report, at least one in five yeshiva or Jewish seminary students has contracted COVID-19 in spite of taking part in government-approved capsule programs starting in August. That's upwards of 7,000 students out of the 35,000 who participated in the program, though a September report by Haaretz News reveals that many of these students violated the capsule regulations, leading many critics to renew attempts to block the reopening of these religious schools after they were closed again for the second nationwide lockdowns in late September. That said, a new look at several synagogues is now showing an evolution in the response to the pandemic, at least among some in the Haredi sector. Recent images captured from a Jerusalem synagogue showing attendees all in masks and separated by plastic barriers. This, the apparent fruit of negotiations between the government's coronavirus authorities and top rabbis, in which officials have agreed to allow a return to schooling, but only if capsule and isolation programs are actually adhered to. The program will also be dependent on a continuing decline in morbidity, and the capsulized groups of students will have to remain in their isolation until after Hanukkah in December. All right, now speaking of health research, an Israeli researcher and a group of interdisciplinary scientists at Cornell University have now just revealed a new method for brain imaging. And of course, it's based on our old friend, the zebrafish. You may recall that earlier in September, Israeli researchers were using zebrafish in cannabis research. And now the fish are being studied again, this time in efforts to better brain mapping technologies. And there's a good reason for this. As the researchers explained, the zebrafish are a great standard model for vertebrate brains, as all vertebrate brains are essentially the same in terms of basic structure and function. So what's the new method? Well, plainly put, specialized lasers are used in extremely short pulses that interact with the molecules in the brain and scatter light from other tissue layers. So essentially, as Jerusalem College of Technology professor and research collaborator Dr. David Seinfeld puts it, we can now shine a laser beam through fish scales and still see the neurons behind them, creating a very high-resolution image even deep within the brain. And this could be a game-changer in the entire field of neuroscience. And last but not least in our lineup tonight, October is nearing a close and with it, annual Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So how has Israel marked the month amidst an ongoing pandemic? Well, first off, many municipal buildings lit up in all pink as is tradition. But beyond that, there were still some more notable events as well. Israeli women's weekly magazine La Isha featured performing artist and breast cancer survivor Elan Nufar on the cover as she wore a pale pink pantsuit that showed off her double mastectomy scars. The 49-year-old Nufar providing hope and saying confidently that she remains a 100% woman. Meanwhile, scooter sharing company Lime has partnered with the Israeli One in Nine NGO to help prompt riders not only to donate to breast cancer research, but also to go and get tested for the disease themselves. And finally, among the many other examples of creative ways to mark the month this year, Israeli President Reuven Rivlin hosted a breast cancer awareness race in the gardens of the president's residence. And Rivlin is addressing the crowds with excellent advice to go and get a screening. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear and cool with lows around 66 Fahrenheit or 19 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow should be clear and sunny again with highs hitting 88 Fahrenheit or 31 degrees Celsius. Now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Oh, what a spooky ghost. Perfect costume ahead of Halloween this, this coming week. All right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.38 shekels to the American dollar and 2.57 shekels to the Canadian dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.